we are in our part one uh, first principles part of the book and we are examining the different kinds of rational spirits and here I began uh, a multi-part series examining angels uh, which are variously called holy angels um, an angel of light or even a man of God I was going to just basically make one video and rush through it but uh, I prayed about it and felt like the Lord said specifically take your time and uh, the reason why I say that is because people seem to be they seem to have this kind of unnatural attraction to angels and I've, I've just never had that uh, I don't know what it is um, that necessarily attracts people to angels um, the, the, like the idea of a guardian angel or some such thing I guess maybe is appealing <coughs> excuse me um, I mean it never appealed to me but uh, so perhaps you'll sense some of my um, I was going to say skepticism but I would say uh, maybe a better word about it is a caution because there's all kinds of even in, in what is called Christianity uh things like messages from angels and obviously that's a that's a biblical thing which we'll we'll look at um, but angel cards and all kinds of encounters with angels um, one of the centers of this is um, this the center of charismania in the United States the Mecca of charismania which is Bethel Church in Redding California and they have all kinds of just um, disturbing things that they they say about angels and the point the point is this anybody can make up anything that they want and say oh an angel told me ooh, I had this encounter with an angel you should listen to what I have to say right what is valuable and what we can know for sure is what God has revealed to us in his word and he has told us um, what it is that we need to know about the spiritual realm. And the idea that we're worried about what some thing that's presenting itself as an angel, there is such a thing as a gift of discernment, because scrutiny about what spirit we're talking about is warranted. Brothers, believe not all spirits, right? Um, we want to know what God has revealed. And so, wouldn't it be better for us to really rely upon the clear and known revelation of God than a claimed revelation from an angel, which may actually be a demon? Jesus. is a, The interesting thing about getting communication from spirits is that a lot of times the, 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 those that are accountable to God, so God, and also his holy angels, a lot of times they're not willing to speak under just such any circumstance because God is God he doesn't need us he doesn't have he's not desperate to speak to us um it's kind of can you imagine the king sitting on his throne and the king is like running around in the slums banging down the doors of peasants and be like I'm gonna talk to you I'm gonna talk to you like when does when does that ever happen um now God is good and he's faithful but he doesn't, he doesn't need us, and he doesn't need to continually give us a message. How interesting is it then that Satan is very happy to give anybody a message? You know, anybody go by any psychic shop or, you know, tarot card reader or whatever and get a message, <laughs> 20 bucks, maybe they'll even do it for free, you know? I mean, it's, it's just like it, it is a low-cost activity. We, we want the truth from what God we know is from God and what he has revealed and not uh, something that claims to be an angel of light, but, you know, we don't really know, right? And so, what does the Word of God, the revealed Word of God, have to say about this and not, you know, some crazy encounter that some person supposedly had? Um, 
the word angel means messenger. And um, what's interesting is that in the King James, in 92 times in the Old Testament, it's translated as angel, the original Hebrew word, and 69 times it's translated messengers, same word, and 22 times it's translated messenger. And so it's translated messenger almost as much, 91 times versus 92 times, it's translated messenger exactly as many times minus one as it's translated angel, right? And um, just to, as an example, uh, Genesis 32, 3, and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, and the message, Genesis 32, 6, and the messengers returned to Jacob. Numbers 20, 14, and Moses sent messengers from Kadesh. Numbers 21, 21, and Israel sent messengers unto Shehan, king of the Amorites. And so, what is a messenger? A messenger is a, a person who is sent. And of course, I mean, you know, uh, one of the names one of the names of God is Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of Hosts, and sometimes the angels of heaven are called the heavenly host, right? And so in Luke, whenever the heavenly host reveals itself to the shepherds of all people, um, that's what they're called, the heavenly host, right? Um, the armies of heaven. They're sent by God. They're accountable to God and they're subject to God, right? Uh, so in this video, I wanna, I wanna make two points. What I think personally are the two most important points about angels um, that we need to know. Number one, they are subject to Christ. Um, talking of Christ, 1 Peter, 322 who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him now ho holy angels that that love God and that have truth in them and that belong to God they they delight in this because Jesus Christ is is very man a very man but he's very God a very God and they cry out holy 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 they love God they delight in him. They are in awe of him. And so the idea that they are made subject unto him and serve him is a, is a, is a good and right consequence and a desirable thing, right? And so it's not like they're grumbling. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God, right? Um, Ephesians uh, 1, 19 through 21. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but the one that is to come. And so not only are angels subject to the Messiah of God, the Christ of God, in this world, but Christ is the head of angels forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Um, you might recall in Paul writes in Philippians chapter two that he was given the name above names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? And so the, the angels are subject to that just like every other knee, every other person, every other name is subject to the name of Jesus and they will obey him and they will serve him forever. Um, Jesus created angels. He created principalities. He created powers. And of course, we can see that just from John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God, and then verse 14, the um, word became flesh and made his home among us. Colossians 1, 16, 
We'll start with uh, 115. Who is the image of the invisible God talking about Christ, the firstborn of every creature? Verse 16, for by him all things were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. And so it's not only that that Jesus outranks and has the name above names of these spirits, but he created them. He made them because he's the author and perfecter. He is the very word of God. He made them exactly as he wanted them to be, right? He gave them every power and every authority. And whether we're talking about wings or we're talking about, you know, gold sashes or harps or, you know, little halos or, you know, whatever we might suppose might be a characteristic of an angel. Strength, title, um, whatever, whatever it is that we might say about an angel, Jesus made them exactly as he wants them to be. And so, the right order of things in creation is for us to recognize our creator and the holy angels of heaven recognize their creator, which is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so to be made subject to him is right. It, it's what they were created for. They are They have a true identity as compared to humans who are mostly deceived. They have a true identity because they are doing what they were created to do. They're fulfilling the divine creative intention over their existence. That's more than most can say. And so that's, um, that's the first, really the critical first point that I want to make about angels is that they are subject unto Christ. And ultimately it is not a, ultimately it is not a burden um, the second thing is, um, again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, this kind of unhealthy skepticism or um, attraction towards angels. And it's like, this is what we do, right? As, as sinners, we, we fixate on creation, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1. Um, we, we worship creation rather than creator, right? We trade the truth for a lie. And the, 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 the question that's begged here is, well, I mean, if you're, if you're fascinated with creation, a.k.a. in this case, angels, how much more should you be fascinated with God? If you want a word, if you wanted an experience, if you want an encounter, okay, you know, God is in the business of doing that. But how about we go to the source and stop wasting our time with an with a, with a underling how about we go to God, right? And so I want to read uh, the first two chapters of Hebrews are really relevant for this. And perhaps they are a lot of what fuels my caution with respect to angels. But um, I'm just going to read uh, the first chapter of Hebrews. Please read the second chapter as well. We want we want to have the right attitude towards angels. And I, I would find myself in times past being, I don't, again, I, I shouldn't use the word skeptical because it's not like I didn't believe that angels existed, but I just, I just was not, not impressed. And, and the, the people who were just so enamored and smitten with them, it just made me all the more, uh, reluctant but the thing is, is that angels are there for a reason, as we shall experience, or as we shall study in um, further videos. They're, they're servants. God made them good, and He made them for a reason and for a purpose. And they, they, they don't exist for no purpose. They exist for a purpose, right? And that is why God created them. And so we'll see that. But they don't exist to be worshipped. They don't exist for us to just be obsessed with them and to be trying to contact them. Okay, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, Name above names, right? Uh, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he, At any time thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Quoting the Psalms here. Um, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him, again a note of the subjection of angels to God's Messiah. Verse 7, And the angels, to, of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved Righteousness and hated inequity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. I believe this is a reference to the anointing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming upon Jesus and the clothing Christ, not only with power, but he was given the Holy Spirit. I mean, it says above thy fellows. He was given the Holy Spirit without limit, okay, um, which cannot be said of anybody else. Uh, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And, I mean, no angel, you know, come on, no angel could remotely would compare such a thing. Let's see. The Lord in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Um, this one, this verse 14, I want to just say a quick comment before I end. Notice they're, they're ministers, they're spiritual ministers, but sent forth to minister. And so how are they sent forth to minister? Are they sent forth to minister because we beckon them and say, angel, come here. Is that, I mean, does that make any sense in the context of this verse? God sends them, right? He cre Jesus created them and he, as the Lord of hosts, sends them where he wants them to go.